Hello everybody, my name is Kara and today I'm here with my August wrap-up. So normally what I've been doing is filming this in two parts and then posting them all together, um, but I read 25 books in August, which I'm really proud of, uh, but that means I, I just do not want to post those all at once and I don't think you guys want to watch that whole wrap-up at once. So I'm actually going to be posting this in two separate parts. So let's see how many I can get through today uh, before my battery dies. The first book I finished in the month of August was Ghost by Jason Reynolds. This is the first book in the track series which is a middle grade contemporary companion series, um, all following characters who are on this track team. Our main character in this book is a boy named Castle Crenshaw but he is known as Ghost and he ends up joining this track team and this is a very short book that really packs a punch. As the book goes on we start to realize um, why Ghost is so good at running and it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, we see him kind of reckoning with some family things that have happened, um, especially related to especially relating to his father, and we see him start to become part of this team and to get to know these kids and to to make friends. And this was a wonderful book. I really enjoyed the writing, um, like the dialogue, and he's like Jason Reynolds is just so good at writing believable dialogue and really getting into the head of his characters. I really liked Castle. Um, I really liked the characters in general in this book. Like there were a couple on the track team even who like. They're, the way they're introduced, you're kind of like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to feel about them. And then they just have one or two scenes. You're like, oh, my heart hurts. And I understand now more <laughs> about why you are the way you are, which is great when like such a short book can still have you like kind of change your opinions on characters. I love that. I think the themes and the plot of this book were really well done. Um, again, like the way that running is used and explored and like literally running but also like what that like figuratively what that means and how those things interact. I love the relationship between Ghost and his mom. That was another highlight of this book. Um, and I also I think this might be the first middle grade book I've read where the main character is dealing with some anger management issues. Um, I, I don't remember reading about a such a young character who has those issues that they're working through before so that was also something I think was really interesting and really important and I gave Ghost 4.5 stars. Really looking forward to continuing the series. Next I finished Trailblazer by Lita Schubert illustrated by Theodore Taylor III and with a foreword by Misty Copeland. The subtitle of this book is The Story of Ballerina Raven Wilkinson. This is obviously a children's picture book and it is about Raven Wilkinson who was the first um, I believe African-American ballerina to uh, is it be signed by a major yeah, the first African-American ballerina to dance with a major American touring troupe, um, and she was a real inspiration to Misty Copeland, who is like one of the most talented dancers in the world today, um, and who is also breaking a lot of barriers, because ballet has always been a very um, white-dominated field, and even today it still very much is. Um, and so to see this picture book about Raven Wilkinson, and to see how her story has kind of come full circle, and that is inspiring Misty Copeland, who is now um, inspiring young girls today, I just think that was really amazing. Like, I have to show you... So Missy Copeland actually got to meet Raven Wilkinson um, and I have to show you. So here is the photograph of them meeting um, and with a foreword by Misty Copeland and here's the illustration of that moment. Like I just think that was so beautiful. Um, I really enjoyed the art in this book. I think it's a really important story. I really liked uh, getting to know the story of Raven Wilkinson's life um, and like the really difficult things that she went through that she shouldn't have had to but the way that she still accomplished so much. I really highly recommend this even if you are not um, like super into ballet or like you don't feel like you know enough about ballet to appreciate this. I think you still would um, and just like the the notes at the beginning and the end of the book I think also make this like just a really like complete package of a really important and wonderful picture book. I just think this is such an important and beautiful story and I gave Trailblazer five stars. Next I finished One Crazy Summer by Rita Williams Garcia. This is the first book in a trilogy and we are following our main character Delphine who is the oldest of three sisters and um, this is set during the 60s I believe. Yeah, 1968 in Oakland, California and the three of them um, get sent to stay with their mother in Oakland uh, for the summer and their mother uh, left them when they were very young so they haven't really interacted with her again until now and their mother is also very involved in the Black Panther Party. Um, and like that movement that is currently going on and I thought this book was fantastic. I loved the writing. Delphine had a really strong personality and that really came through in the voice that this was written in. I think Rita Williams Garcia did a great job of sounding like a kid and not in a way that felt like she was talking down to the middle grade audience this book is intended for. I loved the sibling relationship and how complex that was, like the way that like Delphine's two younger sisters would drive her up the wall sometimes but you always knew that they loved each other even when they were fighting and um, yelling at each other and all of this. It's like that's that's what being a sibling means is like you love them even when you feel like throwing something at them and I feel like that came through really well in this book. Um, like all of the characters I felt like were really well drawn and this is another like pretty short book and I was just really impressed at how like complex so many of these characters were. I think this book did a really great job with some of these complex issues and characters. I had such mixed feelings about Cecile, um, 
who is Delphine and her sister's mother because like there were some times where you felt like you were kind of understanding why she had left like she saw it as um like being part of something that was like bigger than her own family and you could kind of like even if you wouldn't have made the same choice you could kind of like understand why she did it and then there were other times where she just felt like such a selfish um and like frustrating person and I I was just really impressed at the way that um like I was never really sure how things with Cecile were gonna were gonna go or how I even wanted them to go um I think the relationship between Delphine and her mother was and and for her other sisters too but like Delphine is the main character definitely we see more of that um, the relationship between them is not the same throughout the book and it's messy and it's complicated and you're not always sure if it's gonna work out or how you want it to work out or if you want it to work out. Um, and I also think the story of this book was really well done. Like I think we definitely have a very particular image of the Black Panther Party in the United States and I think this book really challenges a lot of those stereotypes um, and how like not everybody involved in the movement is the same and how um, like some of the really like important work that they were doing in communities and things like that. So I thought this book was just fantastic. This is another series I'm excited to continue and I gave One Crazy Summer five stars. Next I finished Dear Sweet Pea by Julie Murphy. This is an ARC um, edition but the book has since come out. And this is a contemporary novel uh, following our main character Patricia who is known as Sweet Pea and her parents have recently divorced so that is one of the things that she is like kind of coming to terms with and trying to deal with. And her neighbor is this older woman who writes like a newspaper kind of advice column um, and she ends up leaving on vacation and she asks uh, Sweet Pea for kind of a favor and through a bunch of things that happen Sweet Pea kind of ends up getting involved in writing letters of advice back to people who submit uh, submit letters to the paper. And so she starts getting mixed up in all of these people's like problems and conflicts and she's not really sure what to do. And while this is going on she's having some issues with friends at school um, or with like ex-friends at school. And I had a lot of mixed feelings about this book. Um, I ultimately was kind of disappointed in it. It wasn't quite what I wanted but I do think it does a lot of important things. Um, like this book handles a lot of really important topics like homophobia and divorce and um, like friendship breakups and friendship fights and even like a little bit of issues of privacy and things like that. We also have a plus size middle grade main character which is just really wonderful to see. So this book does a lot of important things um, but the story itself I did not really enjoy. I actually did like the inclusion of the letters and the way that plotline kind of developed and especially Sweet Pea and her neighbors um, like relationship sort of like getting to know each other and becoming friends a little bit. I actually really enjoyed that but for the most part the actual story of this book I did not enjoy at all. I kind of had to make myself keep reading this book and part of that was because I just had a very unexpectedly visceral reaction to some of the plot that was happening. Like Sweet Pea was like I said going through a really hard time um, with some of her friends or ex-friends at school and just like being humiliated and embarrassed and feeling like really lonely and all of this and even though like the situation that she goes through and the situations that I went through in school um, are not really that similar. There was just something about the way it was written that instantly put me back in like some of the friend drama I went through in middle school and high school that I hadn't thought about in a while and I really didn't want to think about again but obviously that's based on a really like personal experience so like that's not something I think every reader is going to feel but it did actually like color part of my feelings on this book. I also wonder if maybe I wouldn't have had such a strong personal reaction if I hadn't chosen this book for the like book that gives you hope prompt um so maybe that was part of the reason. Setting aside those personal feelings um I also just didn't really enjoy the plot of this book that much. I just found it kind of frustrating and upsetting and I also like can't really remember how I feel about most of the characters. Um, like when I was taking notes for this wrap-up like a lot of times I end up talking about characters you know whether I like them or didn't like them because I'm such a character focused reader and I honestly just could not remember how I felt about them. Um, so I just I just feel like this book didn't quite do it for me. I do think it's an important one um, so I would like still encourage people to read it. It's not that I didn't like it but just for various reasons this didn't quite work for me and I gave Dear Sweet Pea 3.5 stars. Still a good reading but just I didn't love it like I was hoping to. Next I finished The Mermaid Sister by Holly Webb. This is the second book in the Magical Venice series um, which is a companion series that is an Italian inspired fantasy series. And in this book we are following the cousin um, of the main character of the first book who is a girl named Mia and she ends up making friends with a mermaid as you can probably guess from the cover. Um, and this book is also about kind of the aftermath of book one um, and how Mia uh, is dealing with that and like I, I'm just really enjoying this series. I think this series is dealing with a lot of really um, serious themes in pretty subtle ways. Um, like you, you you kind of go into these books and you think you're gonna get like this fun like magical adventure um, like with an Italian setting and like some mermaids or like um, magical water horses in the first book and like you do get that but you also get this undercurrent of 
Like these kids are dealing with things that they shouldn't have to and I think Holly Webb does a really great job of um, writing these really young characters who feel kind of young and old at the same time in a very believable way like because of the time period that this series is sort of loosely based on even though these kids are very young because of their positions in their family or in like politics and everything they're kind of like forced to take on more responsibility than they should and we really see like the toll that takes on them and like these characters feel very believably young while at the same time like hurting your heart because you're like you're you're a child like you shouldn't have to worry about these things um like this book deals a lot with um like kind of like emotionally abusive family relationships but Mia also doesn't realize that that's what's happening at the beginning so it, it was kind of hard to read about that but it was also very rewarding to see Mia grow and change and realize that she deserves more than that. I'm also just really enjoying like the overall story of these books. I find it really engaging and um, just like an interesting plot. Uh, I also think these books they're satisfying but there's that little bit of sadness that kind of keeps the stakes feeling very high. Like I said, I really enjoyed Mia as a main character and her arc. Um, I continue to enjoy the magic in these books and uh, I really enjoyed the addition of mermaids in this one. I enjoyed this book just as much as the first book in the series. Um, the only thing I didn't like so much is a similar thing I said about the first one, which is that the ending felt pretty abrupt to me, um, but everything else I thought was really well done and I gave the mermaid sister four stars. Next I finished Raven Makes the Illusions, adapted from a traditional native story illustrated by Janine Gibbons. Uh, specifically this is based on um, Alaskan native folklore and this is just a very short picture book that retells this legend about the raven figure from Native American folklore uh, creating the Aleutian Mountains and I really enjoyed this. The illustrations are absolutely gorgeous. Let me see if I can find a few examples. I just think these like the colors and the um, art style itself were beautiful and I thought the story was really engaging. Um, this is definitely I think a younger picture book because there's not there's not like a ton of words and it's very short um but i really enjoyed this and i also really appreciated um the introductory and closing notes which i think are definitely more geared towards adult readers like um maybe who are reading this to kids that talk more about the background of the story and the raven figure in um native american folklore and how he has kind of this dual personality of culture hero and also trickster figure so i really enjoyed this and i gave raven makes the illusions 4.5 stars next i finished it's not about the burka edited by mariam khan this is a non-fiction book that is a collection of essays um all written by Muslim women and about varying um, experiences about being a Muslim woman and especially about um, aspects that are not talked about a lot and the whole point of this collection that Mariam Khan wanted to accomplish is to hear from Muslim women in their own words which is not something we uh, do very often unfortunately and I thought this was fantastic. I do have a full Goodreads review on this so I will link that down below. I'm just gonna note like some of my favorites or ones that I had like specific thoughts on. Really enjoyed The First Feminist. I also really liked On the Representation of Muslims Terms and Conditions Apply, um, read in conjunction with The Close of My Faith. Both of those talk about um, like kind of the like surface level representation we're seeing of Muslim women in like beauty campaigns and like what those accomplish and and like what is the end goal of representation in media and like how do these kind of like lip service representations how do those play into that life was easier before I was woke was really funny and really enjoyable and just a very like really good look at like, how people can like rationalize um, their own like status as a marginalized group in various ways so really enjoyed that one. There's no such thing as a depressed Muslim. Discussing mental health in the Muslim community um, was definitely one of my favorites. I thought that one was beautiful and just really thoughtful and really important. And I think it said a lot of brilliant and really important things about the intersection of religion and mental health and how you can't use one as a substitute for the other but we also need to recognize that for a lot of people those things do intersect and to ignore one or the other is not helpful to the person who is going through um, mental health issues. Feminism Needs to Die was a brilliant takedown of white feminism. How Not to Get Married or Why an Unregistered Nika is No Protection for a Woman. It talks specifically about registering marriages in the UK and how certain kinds of marriages don't actually qualify for legal protections and the way that a lot of people are not aware of that. And Daughter of Stories was a really beautiful exploration of the importance of stories and um, the way that knowing your family history can ground and inspire you. I thought that one was really really lovely. And the only essay I had like a less positive experience with was Gender Denied, Islam, Sex, and the Struggle to Get Some. So like keep in mind I'm not Muslim myself so I don't know how Own Voices reviewers felt about that piece but at least for me reading it there were like a lot of places where it kind of felt like the author was saying if you're not having this amount of sex um, you're repressed and like you need to be fixed basically as opposed to let's give women the power to make their own sexual choices including having or not having sex. Like there were some great points made about gender segregation and like religion versus culture and things like that so like I did still like get things out of this essay but that earlier point did dampen my experience. I don't know if the author was 
intending to say that or come across that way, but most of the essay kind of felt like she was saying if you're not having sex like she is then you're repressed and need to be saved so i didn't love that um but this was just a fantastic collection i definitely highly recommend it and i gave it's not about the burqa four stars next i finished reawakening our ancestors lines revitalizing inuit traditional tattooing gathered and compiled by angela hovac johnston um so this is exactly what it sounds like this is a like nonfiction picture book about traditional inuit tattooing practices and how those um they were starting to die out because a lot of the practitioners were like not passing on those skills and obviously with forced assimilation um, those cultural practices were not preserved in the United States um, and recently there's been kind of a resurgence in interest and in people learning them and so um, Angela Hovac Johnston really she wanted to make this her mission to like bring these practices to women who wanted them and um, so she learned how to do them and she had like several other people involved in the project and it's just a really like beautiful project and like the way it's put together um, is lovely. So everybody um, who is in the book talks about their experiences and about like why they chose certain designs um, and what they mean to them and stories that they had heard about what certain designs mean and I just think this is like a really important really lovely book. There's also some introductory material um, about the wider context of Inuit traditional tattooing and about the people who kind of put the project together um, and I actually want to mention the photographer who is Cora Davos. Something that several participants and people working on the project mentioned is how um, how brilliant of a photographer was and how she has this real gift for like making making the subject of her photographs um, feel like their best and like um, just like really like radiant and beautiful and like joyful when she takes these, these photographs and I feel like that really came through in all the photographs in this book. I think it's great that this book exists and I gave Reawakening Our Ancestors lines four stars. Next I finished Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This is a gothic horror novel set in Mexico in the 1950s um, and our main character is Noemi and she gets a letter from her cousin who's recently gotten married and who sends her a letter uh, saying that she thinks he's trying to poison her and that she's afraid and she needs help and so Noemi ends up um, going to visit her cousin at this creepy old mansion uh, to try and figure out what is going on and if her cousin is actually in danger. I love this book so much. Um, I have no idea what order videos are going up in, so I don't know if you've already seen this, but I have a Reasons to Read um, video on Mexican Gothic that should be coming out soon if it's not already out, but I absolutely loved this. I loved Noemi as a main character. Um, she's so smart and compassionate and funny and I really love the way that she's this very feminine character who does not have to grow out of that in order to be competent um, and in order to like work to solve the problems that are going on and everything and actually like her abilities as a socialite and like her ability to charm people um, are part of what makes her like able to figure things out and to like try and navigate what's going on in this creepy mansion and I just think that is so cool. The creepy atmosphere of this book is done brilliantly um, like the horror aspects were I think very effective and like I definitely like I don't read a lot of horror I'm definitely a scaredy cat but I think one of the reasons that I still love this book so much and I'm still like able to read this book is that when Sylvia Moreno Garcia uses horror elements she uses them very purposefully like they're not just for shock factor or to gross you out or for like a cheap plot twist or anything like she uses these horror elements to make some really brilliant social commentary on things like colonization and eugenics and racism and colorism and like there are definitely a ton of trigger warnings for this book as always i will list all of those down below um so do check those out if you need to i actually scanned the list before i went into this book because i had heard that it's a very heavy and upsetting book at points the actual writing of this book was also fantastic Sylvia Moreno garcia has what i would describe as a very precise writing style it's very elegant it's not overly simplistic or anything like you definitely get great descriptions of um of characters or of scenery or of like atmosphere but it doesn't get bogged down in those things like you still have great dialogue between characters um like it's hard for me to describe the exact like blend of her writing but i love it i think just the characters in general were really well developed um there were several of them like several side characters that i really liked and was invested in um but even the ones even the characters that you don't like or that you hate like they're just constructed so brilliantly um i also really liked the ending of this book i found it really satisfying and effective and yeah i this is like one of my favorite books of the year. Um, I gave Mexican Gothic five stars. Next, I finished A Girl Like That by Tanaz Bathina. You follow our main character, Zareen, who is living in Saudi Arabia with some relatives of hers. And at the very beginning of this book, like first chapter, so this is not a spoiler, the book actually starts out with Zareen and a boy named Porus um, dead on the side of a highway. So we get a few chapters covering that. And then most of the rest of the book is kind of a like series of flashbacks about what happened, um, which is not a format I'm usually a fan of, but I think it was like really effective here. And this is one of those books that I think is really important 
but I also had kind of mixed feelings about. Um, I'll start with the things I did like. I think the themes that this book handles about oppression and about bullying and about sexism and misogyny, I think all that was done really brilliantly. Um, this book is really, really difficult to read at times, um, I think because it handles those themes so effectively. I also think it's great to read a contemporary that is set in Saudi Arabia. We still don't really see many of those. I also loved Porus as a main character because we also, like, we get some flashbacks with him too. Um, I just, I just loved him so much. Really enjoyed Porus's character and I was really glad he was in the book. We needed some good things to happen in this book. I liked Zareen too. So it was obviously like really hard to read about what happened. And then as far as the things that I didn't like so much about this book, um, one of the main ones is just this was one of the most emotionally exhausting books I have read in a really long time, um, possibly ever. And I know that's a stupid thing to say when it's a book that deals with such heavy topics, but I do want to mention the way that I always saw this book kind of pitched is that it was about like this very specific, like it was about um, misogyny, it was hard to read because it was about like sexism and um, like hatred of women, violence against women, um, like kind of things associated with that, which I had kind of prepared myself for. And I think sometimes when a book deals with a really heavy theme like that, sometimes that's kind of the only thing that is pitched in the synopsis or in reviews, so you kind of only prepare yourself for that. And then I think sometimes, which is what happened to me with this book, it's like you go into the book and you're ready for those things, and you had no idea about all the other really, really dark things happening in the book because that's how I felt with this one. I also want to be really clear. I'm not like saying this book should have been happier so that I was more comfortable reading it because that's not what I mean. Like, obviously it's really important that this book does deal with these intersections of really difficult topics. The issue that I kind of had with it is not just how it was pitched to me, but also the fact that some of the events that happened in this book felt like they were only happening for the sake of being dramatic, if that makes sense. Like, for example, Zareen, um, she gets a kitten who she loves, and the kitten gets killed in a horribly brutal way. Um, Zareen thinks she's going to make a friend or she's getting to know someone, and then they have a falling out, something terrible happens. Zareen and Porus start to become friends and, like, get to know each other, um, and this is, like, one of the only bright lights in her life, and then they can't see each other anymore, and, like, all these other things go wrong. Like, it was just every single time something slightly good happened, that would be, like, ripped away in the most brutal way possible. And I think if there were just a few times where that happened, it wouldn't, like, it would still have contributed to this book, but the number of times that happened in this book, like, every single time, it just got to a point where it was like, I don't think this book is being as effective as it could have been. For one thing, because it was hard to stay emotionally engaged when it was that, like, depressing and exhausting to read, but also just on a, like, structural level. I think the book wasn't quite as effective as a commentary on these really serious issues because it was also so bogged down in all of the other horrible things that were happening, if that makes sense. So I hope that distinction makes sense. I'm not saying, like, this book was sad, so it's not as good. I mean, like, the specific way that some of those things were handled, I think, made it less effective. Um, and then my other main issue I had with this book is there's a little bit that, it's touch, that it touches on with mental health and mental illness and undiagnosed mental illness and the way that that can, um, that can exacerbate other things going on. Um, and the way that was ultimately handled, I was really not happy with. It kind of felt like we were supposed to think like, oh, well, this character, they maybe really loved this person, so it's okay. Or like, they were stubbornly refusing help for their mental illness, so it wasn't really their fault that they were abusive to this other character. And I really didn't like that. Um, I, like, that's not true. Like, mental health is obviously a really complex issue, but I don't think you can just excuse, uh, everything somebody does because they have mental illness. Like, that's not how it works. Um, and I was really not happy with the way that was resolved. So, altogether, I gave a girl like that 3.75 stars. I do think it's a really important book, and there's a lot of things it does well but some of the things that I don't think it did as well um, did really affect my experience. Next, I finished Good Night Desdemona, Good Morning Juliet by Anne-Marie MacDonald. And this is a play that's pretty much about a, I think a grad student or a professor, assistant professor maybe, um, who is writing her dissertation on um, the possibility that Othello and Romeo and Juliet were actually meant to be comedies, but they were missing the fool character, um, and that's why they turned it into tragedies, which I think is a really interesting concept. I was really interested to read this, and I just felt kind of meh about it ultimately. Um, there were things I really liked, like the Shakespeare-flavored writing of this play I thought was brilliant. Like the way that Anne-Marie MacDonald like, wrote um, like extra scenes or extra dialogue that was still kind of in the style of Shakespeare while also being um, like kind of her own thing too and also being more I think approachable. Um, I thought that was brilliant. I actually really enjoyed the sections that were um, like revisiting the play Othello because the 
the professor character, she actually gets like kind of sucked into the events of Othello and Romeo and Juliet. Um, so the part that takes place during Othello, I actually really enjoyed. Um, Desdemona was a fantastic character. Like the way Desdemona was characterized in this was, I think, really fantastic and really interesting. And I also think this play did some really interesting things with gender and sexuality um, and the way that like there's like cross-dressing and like characters falling in love with different people of different genders. I think that was explored in a really interesting way. Um, but I also had a lot of things I didn't like. So I really, really didn't like the section that happened during Romeo and Juliet because like the basic setup for that part is that um, like Romeo and Juliet are actually miserable together and they wouldn't be able to stand each other. And like, listen, Romeo and Juliet is not my favorite Shakespeare, but there was something that felt really, um, I guess, depressing about having this famous tragedy that ends with these two teenagers dead. It, there's something that was very depressing about turning that into a like bickering married couple um, kind of thing. I really didn't like that. And then besides that, I just think that the plot part of Romeo and Juliet was not as interesting. I also didn't really like the frame story parts of this play. Um, I mean, there's only a little bit really. It's not that much of the play, um, but like Constance as a character who's like the main character, I didn't find her very interesting at all. Um, and I was also not super engaged with her like part of the story, like kind of the um, the events that take place at the beginning, like her scenes with, like her scenes like in the college essentially. Um, I didn't really care for those either. And then even though I liked some of the like themes this play explores, I think some of the commentary was ultimately very shallow. Um, and I think this was written, I think this play came out in like the 90s or okay, 80s, um, late 80s. And you can kind of tell with like some of the takes on feminism, like it's not the worst I've ever read, but there were definitely some elements of it where I'm like, hmm, that felt um, kind of lacking in nuance. And then just on like a personal preference level, besides the Romeo and Juliet thing I mentioned, um, something about the concept for this play, which I didn't know going in, um, really rubbed me the wrong way. Because I went into this thinking that the concept was that these plays would have been comedies, but Shakespeare decided not to write a fool character or something. And the actual concept is actually like Shakespeare took the plots from other playwrights and just like wrote out the fool character. So basically that he just like lifted the entire play from somebody else and then just like cut a character and made it his own. And listen, like Shakespeare, he was a big fan of copying plots from other people. I think every Shakespeare fan can, can acknowledge that. He was very good at taking other people's stories and making them more popular and like, you know, like adding like better writing and all these other things. Like that was a thing that playwrights did at that time is like, that's just what you did to write most plays. Um, but there was something about having this, having this premise um, in a play when like we still, like the whole like authorship question, like there are still people out there who argue that Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. And I kind of resent that this play almost like, almost like validates that a tiny bit by saying like that the whole premise of this play is that Shakespeare copied from other people. I don't know if that made sense at all. Basically like, yes, Shakespeare incorporated stories from other playwrights, he retold things, retellings were a big thing at the time he was writing, but the way that this play specifically did it kind of irritated me because like there are still people out there who think it's true. And I don't think we need to be encouraging that. Um, I know this play came out like a couple decades ago, but even at the time it came out, that, that theory should have been put to rest. Um, it's ridiculous and classist and just absurd. There is no evidence to suggest it and I need to stop talking about this before I get <laughs> completely off topic. Um, but yeah, so I give Goodnight Desdemona, Good Morning Juliet, three stars. There were some things I liked. Like, it was fine. And finally, the last book I'm going to talk about in this first wrap-up for August, I just did it again, I just forgot the month again, is The Queen's Secret by Jessica Day George. This is the second book in the Rose Legacy trilogy. Um, and the first one we follow our main character Anthea who um, is an orphan and she's been kind of like bounced around from different relatives and she finally gets sent to um, I think like a distant uncle or something who lives beyond the wall of their kingdom which is kind of this wilderness that most people don't really know anything about and Anthea ends up discovering that there are horses there and she's really scared initially because um, everybody like everyone in her kingdom fears horses they were actually believed to be the source of this plague that happened um, like many years ago so there's a lot of like fear and distrust and dislike of horses I can't really say much about the plot of the second book because that would spoil things about the first book. But as you can probably tell from the cover, uh, Anthea starts to become more comfortable around horses. Um, we start learning about this magic that is associated with horses. And there's also a lot of like political things that are happening um, in this series. And I really enjoyed the second installment. Um, initially, I was not sure if I was going to like this as much as book one because 
Um, the plot at the beginning wasn't quite as engaging to me, but once we started getting into like more plot developments and like especially the political intrigue, I really started enjoying this. Um, I also think the characters are really great. Like I really enjoy Anthea as a main character and Jilly, her cousin who they're who she's now friends with. That was one of the things I said about book one is I wish they had been friends earlier. Well, they're friends now and I really love that. Um, and I think Jessica de George is just really great at group dynamics in general. Um, like family relationships and friendships and she also does a little sprinkle of romance in most of her books, uh, sometimes more than a sprinkle. So I just think like all of those character interactions and just like group dynamics in general she's really good at. And I also really loved the ending of this book. I'm super excited for book three. The only other thing besides the slow plot at the beginning of this book is there are a few times where a character like didn't ask for clarification about something important and like reading the book I could tell it was important and I was like you need to ask for somebody to explain this and Anthea didn't and it kind of felt like that was just to like prolong the suspense a little bit rather than for like a believable plot reason. So that was a tiny bit frustrating but overall I really really loved this book and I gave The Queen's Secret four stars. Okay everybody so that is it for part one of my August wrap-up. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books what you thought of them or if you're going to pick them up. I will see you soon for part two with which I really hope takes less time to film than this one, but we'll see. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!